Hello, Four Lakes family. It's good to be with you tonight. And for those of you who are not a member of the Four Lakes congregation, we are glad that you're here as well. Welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we return to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we are back to our study of the book of Numbers within that study. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 13. Tonight we hope to cover numbers 13, 14, and 15. We're moving rather quickly through these. We won't be studying every single verse in this section of scripture, but we're doing an overview, making sure that we cover the important details. If you have any comments or questions about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, let us know. We want you to get in touch. You can send a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to our study of numbers, and tonight we hope to take a look at numbers 13, 14, and 15. As we've discussed over the past several weeks, numbers is a book of numbers. So in this book, we have a record of the census that was taken at the beginning of the time in the wilderness, and then we'll have another census at the end of their time in the wilderness before they cross over into the promised land. And the grand total is just over 600,000 fights men leading us to assume a total of everybody roughly two to three million people when we include the women and the children and in between the first census and the last one we've got a few updates along the way a record of some of the things that happened in the wilderness well the book of numbers also explains why the people didn't go straight from Egypt to the promised land a trip that should have just taken a few weeks at the most and why that trip took 40 years instead and that's where we are tonight so tonight then we're going to come to another incident where God is absolutely exasperated by some whining and some complaining, which in this case especially is a lack of faith. That's what it goes back to. However, before we get there, I want to ask whether you recognize some names. Do any of these names sound familiar? Shamua, Shapat, Igal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, and Guel. Now I'm guessing that most of us probably do not recognize these guys, and there is a really good reason for that. So let's pick up tonight with Numbers 13, verses 1 through 16. Numbers 13, 1 through 16. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. These then were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, the son of Zachar. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vashvi. From the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. But Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Well, we may not see it this way, having only read this first paragraph, but this is really a test of faith right here. God has Moses send out 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes. These are leaders in their tribe. So these are men of authority. They have the ability to make some decisions. And these men are sent to go spy out the land of Canaan. And I think you understand where I was going with the 10 names that I read just a moment ago. 10 of those names in this list we no longer recognize, do we? We don't remember these men. And there is a reason for that. The other two men are Joshua and Caleb. By the way, we've got a passage over in Deuteronomy chapter 1 that seems to indicate that sending out the spies was something the people wanted and that God simply allowed it, and that God commanded it because the people demanded it. So feel free to look that up on your own, uh, but it seems that God was perhaps being flexible here. He was kind of listening to the people's opinions. They wanted to send out spies, and so he allowed that to happen. And so he authorized sending these men to go spy out the land. 
So let's continue tonight with Numbers 13, verses 17 through 24. Numbers 13, 17 through 24. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country, see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob at Lohath Hamath. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the valley of Eshcol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. As we look at the mission that these men are given, I hope we notice they are not told to come to any conclusions as to whether they could take the land, because they've already been told to take the land. So really, that is not to be in question at this point. That's not the mission here. The mission here is to scope out the land. They are simply to observe. What are the people like? How many live there? Is it good land? Is it fortified? And so on. And then also, try to bring back, back some of the fruit of the land. I, that's kind of interesting to me. First of all, I can still see in my mind some of those visual aids from Sunday school in my childhood. Uh, those two men hauling that giant cluster of grapes on a pole. And I, I think, in a sense, that was part of the point of this. That is kind of what Moses had in mind. I mean, Moses could have said, you know, draw me a picture of the fruit. Or he could have said, describe it in words. But I find it interesting as a leader that he wanted a visual aid. Moses wanted something impressive that would encourage the people. He wanted the wow factor. When these men came back, he wanted the people to be encouraged by their report. And of course, God knew what was there. God knew how amazing this land was. Well, the men did as they were instructed. They looked around up there. And they came back as instructed with this huge cluster of grapes as well as some of the pomegranates and the figs. So let's continue then with the next paragraph, Numbers 13, verses 25 through 33. Numbers 13, 25 through 33. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. In this passage, notice, we find out that they were on this mission for 40 days. That'll be significant a little bit later. So they come back at the end of those 40 days. They give their report, not only to Moses and Aaron, but this is public, isn't it? This is to the entire congregation. This is out in the open. And they present Moses with the ginormous uh, cluster of grapes. They explain that the land truly does flow with milk and honey. But I want us to notice most of their report is about how big the people are. 
There's this nevertheless, isn't there? They're at the beginning of verse 28. And from that point on, they talk about the fortified cities and the huge people and, and how difficult this is going to be. And apparently the people start getting loud and unsettled at this point. We're not explicitly told that. But I say that the people get noisy and they start getting concerned and, and they're getting loud because in verse 30, Caleb has to quiet the people before Moses. In other words, they were murmuring, murmuring, they were grumbling, they were complaining, they were talking about this, they were getting concerned among themselves, they were getting loud and unsettled. And Caleb can see this, and his message is basically, yeah, the people are huge, people are numerous, yep, the cities, they're fortified, but we can do this. God has told us we can do it, we're going to do it. However, I also want us to notice that the other spies at this point contradict Caleb. At this point, they are no longer simply reporting as Moses had instructed them to do, but now they're weighing in on what to do next. And their message is, as the ten spies, we can't do this. The people are too strong for us. And as if that's not enough, they continue, they describe this as a land that devours its inhabitants. That's a little bit over the top, isn't it? And there are giants in the land. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. And not only are we like grasshoppers, they look at us like as if we're grasshoppers as well. They just kind of throw that in there at the end. In my mind, this right here is like a church business meeting gone wrong. Somebody steps up with a really good idea. This is something God wants us to do. But then everybody starts piling on with a list of reasons why we can't do what God has told us to do. If you've ever seen that happen in a meeting, there is this path of faith. This is the, the clear path here. But once one or two start talking about the reasons why we can't, sometimes that kind of whining is contagious. And pretty soon the path forward gets vetoed by the majority. Sometimes it gets vetoed by the minority. So let's continue with Numbers uh, 14 verses 1 through 10 as we transfer over into the next chapter. Numbers 14, 1 through 10. Let's notice what happens next. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. As a result of the report from 10 of the 12 spies, the people are completely disheartened, aren't they? And instead of listening to God, they listen to this negative report from the majority, and they cry and they weep all night long. And the next morning, they grumble and they whine, they complain against Moses and Aaron, and their message is, we wish we had died back in Egypt. You know, even dying in the wilderness would have been better than this. And they see God is bringing them up to Canaan just to watch them be slaughtered by the sword. Now, in my mind, that's kind of an insult. That's really an insult to God, isn't it? I'm thinking God could have saved some effort by just killing them in Egypt. I mean, if that was his mission. But they aren't thinking clearly. They aren't thinking through this. This, this whining, this lack of faith, it has infected the whole group. And it's so bad, they start talking with each other and I want us to notice they decide to appoint a new leader who's going to lead them back to Egypt. Doesn't that also sometimes happen today? Here's this thing that we need to do, and our leader is, is leading us or pressing us or encouraging us in this direction. We don't want to do it. All in favor, let's get a new leader. And that's pretty much what they're doing here. 
Now imagine the impact that this would have had on Moses and Aaron. Remember, they didn't ask to lead these people in the first place. They didn't even want to be here. And at this point, though, Joshua and Caleb speak up. They tear their clothing, so it's a sign of extreme sorrow, a sign of mourning. And they give their report. Again, it's a good land. And if we're pleasing to God, we can do this. And instead of us falling by the sword at the hands of the Canaanites, they will be our prey. So yeah, they're strong, but we can do this. God has removed their protection from them. And in response, though, the people start making the decision now to stone Joshua and Caleb with stones. And so, and so instead of falling by the sword up in Canaan, as they feared might happen, they're now getting ready to kill each other, aren't they? There's no enemy involved here at this point. So they are turning on one another. And notice at this point, God shows up, doesn't he? Right there at the very end of that last verse. So let's continue on and see what happens next in Numbers 14, verses 11 through 19. Numbers 14, 11 through 19. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them, and I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it. For by your strength you brought up this people from their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night, now, if you slay this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your name of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring this people into the land which he promised them by oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. But now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So God then interrupts the whining. And he's mad, isn't he? Their whining is a symptom of unbelief. And the unbelief comes in spite of tremendous evidence. God has given them plenty of reasons to believe. But the people are still choosing not to have faith that God can do what he said that he would do. That's really what's going on here. You know, imagine being led into battle by a God who can humiliate the most powerful nation on earth with plagues of locusts and flies and bugs and, and all of that. Imagine being led into battle by a God who can divide the Red Sea. Imagine being led into battle by a God who can provide unlimited bread and meat and water to millions of people in the wilderness. That's amazing. This is stuff they'd already seen, but the people can't see it. They had seen it, but they're not recognizing it. And so God then explains to Moses, I'm about to kill them all and start over with you. You're going to be my new nation. We're going to just start over. Well, starting in verse 13, though, Moses intercedes, and he's done this before. He speaks up on behalf of the people. He steps in between the people and God, so to speak. And his reasoning is, God, if you do this, it's going to look really bad <laughs> to the Egyptians. And it's an interesting argument. You know, God, if you do this, it'll be a public relations nightmare. That's just my summary of this. Uh, don't want to be irreverent with that, but that seems to be what Moses is saying. And so Moses then reminds God of God's own loving kindness, doesn't he? And Moses encourages God not to destroy the people, but to forgive. You've forgiven them before. Please, dear Lord, forgive them again. Don't start over. Don't wipe them all out now. So let's continue with Numbers 14, verses 20 through 35. Numbers 14, 20 through 35. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. 
But my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valleys. Turn tomorrow and set out to the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from twenty years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness." Your sons shall be shepherds for forty years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, forty days. For every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even forty years, and you will know my opposition. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be destroyed, and there they will die. Remember in the previous paragraph, God is ready to kill them all and start over with Moses. But Moses begs God to change his mind, and now God announces that he has pardoned them according to Moses' request. However, God also lets Moses know that this will be a teachable moment. Instead of killing this generation immediately and starting a new nation from scratch, those who saw God's miraculous signs and still complained, those people will die in the wilderness. But their children, anyone under the age of 20, will be allowed to enter the promised land eventually. Now the exceptions to this will be Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who had faith that God could do what he said he would do. Everyone else is going to die in the wilderness, and God will do this, not immediately, but it'll happen over the next 40 years, one year for every day that they spied out the land. You know, as parents, I know we've talked about this before, we did the best we could to have the punishment fit the crime. And I think that's what we see happening here. This will be an opportunity to learn something. All the adults would die anyway over the natural course of life. But by delaying the entry into the promised land, God is sorting things out. And in a sense, starting over in his own way while teaching a valuable lesson at the same time to this upcoming generation. By the way, I hesitate to spoil it for you, but more than 40 years later, when Joshua is deciding who goes where and who gets what when they land in the promised land, he gets to Caleb. And Caleb is 85 years old at that time. And Joshua gives Caleb a choice. Where do you want to settle? Okay, they're the only two old guys in the whole nation. And Joshua's like, you know, you pick. You know, you've been with me for the whole for the whole ride here. But and I, again, I'm paraphrasing, but as an old guy, Caleb pretty much steps up and says, give me the land with the biggest giants and the most fortified cities. And I'm going to go drive them out myself with the Lord's help, of course. Caleb is an awesome character, and I am so glad that we have a Caleb in our congregation. Um, if you look this up, I believe the Hebrew name Caleb means dog. I looked it up again this afternoon. If you just look in a standard Hebrew dictionary, I mean, you know, we name people stuff, like some neat names. So Caleb means dog, and I think it fit him pretty well, didn't it? Caleb was a tough old man. And he was a man of tremendous faith. And I just find it interesting that at the age of 85, he says, give me the toughest land and we're going to do this with God's help. Before we move on from this, I think maybe we should also ask ourselves, what's up with the age of 20? Why, why 20 years old as the cutoff? And you know, it's not explained here. I don't think it's really explained anywhere in the word of God. But in my mind, I'm assuming that God recognizes that anybody 20 years old and older should have known better. I, that's my summary of this. You know, so I would kind of take this as something of an age of accountability, but I would also add that I think there's a huge dose of grace here, in my opinion. The way I see it, a 19-year-old back then 
also should have known better. Okay, so 20 years old and upward, they all knew better. A 19-year-old probably should have known better too. An 18-year-old probably should have known better than to grumble against God and Moses. A 17-year-old probably would have seen the 10 plagues a, a year or two earlier, and, and he or she should have known better as well. A 5-year-old? Not so much. They're not really going to get it. But in his abundance of grace and mercy, you know, if you've got a, if you've got this sliding scale, you know, where do you make the cutoff? I, I, I would see this with God and his grace and in his mercy, his love and his tolerance, we might say, he set that age at 20. And I, I do think that we at least need to consider this when we start thinking about the age a young person needs to be baptized. You know, just because someone in the lower end of the age spectrum thinks they need to be baptized, and just because they know the steps from the Bible, just because they can pass a quiz or something, that doesn't necessarily mean they are ready. And it doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to punish them for eternity if they're not baptized by the age of 9 or 12 or whatever. And I know it's a, it's a hard question, it's a difficult discussion to have. We, we assume the best, we want to do what God wants us to do. I know as parents we want our children to obey the gospel. Uh, but let's also make sure that we don't push too hard, um, especially in those younger ages and especially when God's cut off in the Old Testament times was 20. And I, I, you know, I'm not saying the age is 20 today. I, we don't have that given to us. But I'm just saying, I think this needs to at least be a part of the discussion. I hope that makes sense. If you have other feedback on that, in terms of the age somebody should be when they're baptized, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, a preacher up in Minnesota made an impression on me a few years ago by asking the question, would you allow your 8-year-old to sign a 30-year mortgage? And, of course, the answer is no. And so the discussion following is, why not? Well, because they have no concept of responsibility over the next 30 years. And do you see how that also applies to this decision on w when a young person is accountable to God for their sins? I think that figures in there. So let's just not get too nervous if our kids aren't being baptized by 7, 8, or 9. And uh, let's just keep in mind the cutoff in the Old Testament. God being above and beyond gracious and merciful set that age at 20. And we at least need to think about this as we have this discussion on the age of accountability today. Well, let's continue with Numbers 14, verses 36 through 45. Numbers 14, 36 through 45. As for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning a land, even those men who brought out the very bad report of the land died by a plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive out of those men who went to spy out the land. When Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. But Moses said, Why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? Do not go up, or you will be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword, inasmuch as you have turned back from following the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country. Neither the Ark of the Covenant, nor the Lord, nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and struck them and beat them down as far as Hormah. Well, we've got two things going on here, don't we? First of all, the ten spies who brought the whining report are killed by a plague right there on the spot, very publicly. But secondly, once Moses explains that their journey to the promised land will now not take two weeks, but it's going to drag out over 40 years to the point where all of them die except those under the age of 20, when that report gets out, when Moses says that, the people rebel. They recognize their sin, but they're not okay with the consequences. And so I want us to notice they plan on pressing forward, don't they? They don't care about God's blessing. They don't need God's assistance. That's it. We're out of here. We don't need God to go into the promised land. We're going to do this on our own from here. And Moses warns them, don't do it or you will die. However, they go anyway. 
and they are immediately beaten down exactly as Moses says would happen. Well, let's continue into the next chapter tonight, Numbers 15, and we'll just summarize the first 31 verses by reading the first few verses of chapter 15, then we'll kind of skip ahead from there. So looking forward now to what's coming 40 years down the line, we come to Numbers 15, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land where you are to live, which I am giving you, then make an offering by fire to the Lord. And then he goes on to give various details concerning the sacrifices they are to offer. Now I want us to think about this. Who's he, who's he talking to right now? Who's he speaking to? If I've understood this correctly, he's not talking to those 20 years old and older. They're not going to make it to the promised land. So to whom is Moses speaking at this moment? He's talking to the kids. He's talking to the teenagers in the congregation. And he's saying, when you make it to the promised land, you're going to need to know this about these sacrifices that you need to make. And a pretty big part of it was that the Israelites and the aliens living among them are to offer sacrifices using the same guidelines. We have that in this section. But since we've already looked at some of the rules for the various sacrifices, primarily back in Leviticus, I just want us to notice that even after what they've been through with the whining and the promised death of a generation uh, through the 40-year delay, God is saying, the young ones among you, you are going to make it to the promised land. And when you get there, I want you to make these sacrifices. So this right here, even after the slaughter and the plague in the previous chapter, this is a message of hope. You're going to make it. Toward the end of this passage, in verses 27 through 31, I put the verses up here. We're not going to read those. But I just want us to notice that God makes a distinction between those who sin unintentionally and those who sin defiantly. Those who sin unintentionally are able to make a sacrifice to cover that sin so they can be forgiven. But those who sin willingly, there is no sacrifice for that. They are to be cut off from their people. There is no sacrifice that God has arranged to cover intentional sin, which is terrifying. Well, so let's conclude tonight with the last two paragraphs in Numbers chapter 15, and, and these may be related. Uh, this is Numbers 15, 32 through 41. They kind of go together. Numbers 15, 32 through 41. Now, while the sons of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation, and they put him in custody because it had not been declared what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord also spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and that they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord, so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you played the harlot, so that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Well, in the first paragraph, notice they have something of a test case, don't they? They find a guy gathering wood on the Sabbath day, so somebody notices this and they raise the alarm. They know this is against the law, but they seem a bit unsure of themselves, don't they? And kind of, now what do we do? And there may be times even today when we know this is what the Word of God says, but we hesitate. Really? Did he really mean that? And, and so there is that slight hesitation. Maybe it seems to be severe or whatever, and that's what happens here. They're new at this. They've never had to enforce the law like this before, and so they bring to the guy to Moses to render a verdict. And this is one of the rare cases in the Old Testament where somebody is put in custody. I want us to notice that. Remember earlier we said they didn't have jails because it was either like the death penalty or some sacrifice was made leading to forgiveness. There's really nothing in the middle. I think this would be one of those exceptions. Um, they, they put the guy in custody. They bring him to Moses just so Moses could make a decision. So God speaks to Moses, and the answer is yes, this man needs to be put to death. He violated the law. He's guilty. He did it on purpose. 
Oh, we know the penalty is death by stoning, so that's what you need to do. They stoned the man to death for collecting firewood on the Sabbath. And that would have been a learning experience, I mean, uh, for the whole nation to see this. I mean, first of all, they know God is serious about them following the law. And then secondly, now they know what they need to do to keep the nation pure. They need to keep up with this. This is what God has said. We need to enforce it. And the second paragraph, I think, may be related, and, and this is why. After the incident with the guy collecting firewood on the Sabbath, God has Moses tell the people to put these tassels on the corners of their garments as a reminder to follow the Lord's commandments. So if you think about this, every day when they got dressed, and then throughout the day, they would see those tassels. Everybody in the nation was running around with these little blue tassels hanging off the corner of their robes. And the purpose of those tassels was to serve as a reminder. You people are different. Maybe you've heard about tying a string around your finger to remember something. I've never done that. I don't think I've ever seen that done. Maybe it must be an old thing. Uh, but today we have other ways of remembering stuff, don't we? Um, I make lists. I have a, a multiple lists going on on my phone. Uh, I leave post-it notes where I'll find them. I set alarms on my phone. Uh, but that seems to be the point of this. God was giving them this practical reminder to follow the law. You are to be holy. You are different from the world, and you're going to look that way. Uh, by the way, we've got a reference to these tassels in the New Testament. Uh, I'm thinking of at least two situations that may be repeated a time or two in the Gospel accounts. I didn't look up every single one of them. Uh, but first of all, in Matthew 23, 5, if you remember, Jesus condemns the Pharisees for lengthening their tassels to make themselves seem more holy than others. <laughs> so they had taken these tassels and they had twisted them into an opportunity to brag. My tassels are longer than your tassels, therefore I am more holy than you. Uh, but that is not how that works, is it? And God, uh, Jesus, condemned them for it. I mean, he was brutal in that assessment in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 23, like the seven woes on the Pharisees, that was one of them. And then secondly, another kind of chunk or related references under the New Covenant, we've got a few references to people reaching out and touching the tassels or the fringes of Jesus' garments in order to be healed, including a very specific reference to the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years in Matthew 9, verse 20, and Luke 8, verse 44. And it's just a passing reference. But this woman, in the crowd, like couldn't approach the Lord directly, so she reached out and touched the tassels that were hanging from his garments. So this confirms that Jesus wore tassels. Jesus obeyed this command in Numbers chapter 15, and he obeyed it perfectly, like 1400 something years later. And I just found that interesting. Hopefully you do as well. So this brings us to the end of the first 15 chapters now of the book of Numbers. So next week we want to pick up with number 16 as we come to another example of whining. And it's a big one. A lot of people are going to die on that one. And we'll get there in a week if the Lord wills. But thank you again for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you as a congregation, we hope you'll reach out by sending, sending an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being a God who rewards the faithful. We also know from Scripture that you punish those who show a lack of faith through whining and through a complaining spirit. Father, we ask that you give us the faith of Joshua and Caleb. Help us to trust you even more tomorrow than we have today. And help us to encourage each other as we see the day of judgment coming closer. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We love you and we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.